Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. So I also want to thank organizers for inviting me and uh, making uh, this nice conference happen. So I'll tell you a little bit about our experiments at Princeton University where we investigated these Majorana modes in atomic chains on the surface of a superconductor. And I would like to actually start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators. So the experiments were done in a group of Professor Ali Azdani from Princeton, who is actually an expert in uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. Together with Ilya Sanju and Jungpil, uh, we also had a great theoretical help from Professor Ander Bernevig and his postdoc Jian Lee, as well as Prof. Professor Alan uh, McDonald and uh, postdoc Hua Chen, who, who did some DFT calculations for us. So we already heard how to braid Majoranas once, uh, once you get them. Uh, but I'll go a step back and, and try to actually uh, explain how to get Majoranas in the first place. And that's, a, that's actually not, a, not an easy task to, to, to do. And this is the, basically the recipe which was proposed first theoretically and then several uh, experimental groups try to realize it in different systems. But it turns out to, to make Majoranas, you need three ingredients. You need uh, uh, superconductivity, you need magnetism, and you need spin-orbit coupling. So let me guide you through this cartoonish way how to get Majoranas. So basically, if you have a 1D system, and you have a parabolic band of electrons, and this parabolic band is double generated to spin. So now, if you can switch on the spin-orbit interaction in this system, you will split the spin up and spin down uh, bands in a momentum space. This is just a consequence of a spin-orbit coupling. So the next thing you need is to apply magnetic field. So what magnetic field does, it actually, if applied in a direction suitable for Majoranas, which is perpendicular to the spin orbit direction, it will open a gap in this band structure. And now, as you crank up the field, this gap becomes larger and larger. And now you, you get a, to a situation where if you can have different outcomes depending on your position and your Fermi level. So your Fermi level uh, can cut both of these bands or it can basically touch one of these bands and, and cut the other one or it can only go through one of the, of the two bands. And in, in a some sense these two situations are kind of topologically distinct. So on one hand you have an uh, even number of crossing uh, of uh, the spring split bands and in the, on the other you have odd number of crossing and this is somehow this this middle case is is this kind of boundary case where you if you imagine this in some topological way well, well you're going from a ball and trying to punch a hole into a ball this is this moment where you actually are punching through the hole through the ball and you get a donut so now, if you add a superconductivity to this picture, so you have, we have now spin-orbit coupling, we have magnetism. If you add superconductivity, nothing effectively changes, except that you create a gap. So you have a gap, gapped trivial phase and a gap topological phase. And in this, in this middle, you, you can see, so this is the band structure, for, uh, uh, for, which is actually come from this band structure just by adding a superconductivity. And what happens here, you can notice that you have uh, twice as many bands, and this is due to electron hole symmetry induced by superconductivity. And now you have, you have a superconducting gap. Uh, and as you increase this magnetic field, you kind of close this gap around k equals zero, and you reopen it. And once when you reopen it, you are in, in what we call this uh, topological phase. And then kind of a natural way to think how you get Majorana from this picture is now imagine that you have a, a 1D superconductor, which is in, some, in one region topological with this inverted band structure, and in the outside region is trivial with non-inverted band structure. So if you go from a topological to a trivial, 
At some point, these bands have to uh, kind of untwist, and this is where you expect your Majorana's to occur. So this is, this is the recipe which was proposed back in 2010, and in, on a very simple level, this is how we actually wanted to realize Majorana fragments. And it was done uh, soon after in Delft, where they actually combined uh, semiconductor nanowire, so this here is a nanowire, they, and they place it on a whole bunch of gates to tune this chemical potential. Then they, you, you put a, on top of that you put a superconductor, and the way how you actually, you also apply magnetic field, and the way how you probe these Majorana modes is by uh, injecting electrons into this superconductor we, via this nanowire. And, and there, one of the specific signatures of Majorana modes is that they occur at zero energy. So what they measure in Delft is basically this, at finite field, they, they measure this uh, zero uh, bias peak, which then you can actually trace back and, and try to see it under what condition it disappears and what are these conditions. And you can make some tests which can convince some people or not others whether this is a Majorana or not. So what we wanted to do in Princeton is actually go one step further and we wanted to try to actually verify spatially if there is a, such a mode, but that, that, that does it really occur at the ends of, of, of such a kind of topological region. And unfortunately, this particular system is not super, well, it's pretty hard actually to measure using scanning probe microscopy with that resolution. So what we did, we actually were thinking about different systems which would be suitable for, for this experimental technique. And the starting point of, of what I will, I'm going to present is actually a magnetic atom just on the surface of a superconductor. And what happens if you put a single magnetic atom on a superconductor is that you will create so-called in-gap states which, which have this u sheep or sino states and uh, they occur just because there's an exchange coupling between your magnetic atom and the underlying superconducting <coughs> condensate. So if you place this atom besides your usual coherence peaks, what you will see, you will see other peaks coming in and creating an in-gap state. And this is actually a spatial profile of such, a, uh, such an atom on a superconductor. So this is an actually iron atom on the surface of flat. And if you, if, if you make a, this mapping of a conductance at a particular bias, which is inside the gap, here taken at one, around one millivolt, and the gap for the lead is 1.35, you will see that outside the superconductor there are no states, so this is this blue, but if you, if you go directly on top or a little bit sideways on, on this uh, um, atom, you will see a finite number of states, or a finite density of states. Uh, now it's actually, see that this laser is a little bit dying, so I will switch to another laser. Okay, this is better. So if you now imagine that you can actually create a chain of atoms. What, what determines the life, life pattern of the wave of the That's a good question. Uh, several things. So in experimentally, temperature is one, one, temperature is one problem. Uh, there is also a coupling, so this was measured with the scanning tunneling microscopy, so also coupling between the tip and the atom can, can con so you can broaden this, uh, let's say, line width uh, by, by just approaching it uh, and, and kind of retracting your tip. So, but even, even if I kind of take into account these two, there is an, a third mechanism which is not very well understood and it may have to do with some inner dynamics of the system. So this, I'm now like jumping ahead. 
I will show some uh, experimental curves on the chain, and then we can discuss more what 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 are the possible. There are no second order perturbation processes that uh, work with delta the denominator that would give it some lifetime. Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, in, in, the, in a sense, that we can just measure them, and they always appear at, at some finite width. In our experiments, it was still limited by the temperature. In principle, it can also be determined by the, by the coupling to your tip. And if there is, is, is there something beyond that, uh, that can well be. So, if you would manage to place this array of atoms, which are like kind of nicely here ferromagnetically arranged, and you have a substrate with a strong spin-orbit coupling, you could imagine that you realize this, the same situation as in these wires. You basically have an inverted band structure in the middle of the chain and not inverted band structure at the uh, chain, uh, outside the chain. And these type of systems in general are very well suitable for scanning tunnel microscopy because there are many examples of various atoms arranged on various surfaces which you can do with a great precision. And in principle they can be disorder free. So, uh, I mean, th this, this kind of uh, proposal actually combines the ingredient which I mentioned before. So basically, the, you, from magnetic atoms, you get the magnetism, you have superconductivity and the spin orbit coupling from this underlying substrate. And, and just, a, just, a, just a side note is that if you could arrange in some clever way atoms which, which are actually uh, not ferromagnetically coupled, but coupled in some kind of uh, cyclic uh, way or some kind of uh, chiral way, you don't even need a spin-orbit coupling because this, this kind of arrangement would actually mimic spin-orbit coupling plus the magnetism itself. And, and there are many proposals which actually propose this type of uh, systems. Some of them here without spin-orbit coupling from Carl Binnaker's group. We also kind of had our own proposal from, the, from these atoms and the STM tip. Uh, and then there are various other ways where you can actually do it in 1D <coughs> or in 2D where you actually can create in this 2D system some kind of a kernel mode, at least in theory. And what, what is nice about, about this is actually I, I presented only data on oh, data, the, the introduction only on one band, but actually this works if you have several bands as well. So this is just an example of, of some kind of tight binding calculations where you have realistic or quasi-realistic uh, iron which has five bands and if the exchange coupling is large and you basically split spin up and spin down bands uh, you can still have a, this situation where your Fermi level crosses an odd even of or odd number of bands and this is just some kind of a phase diagram where you tune your chemical potential or you kind of have a chemical potential and exchange coupling and depending where you on this phase diagram you are either in topological or not trivial uh, phase. So this exchange coupling between what and what? So, uh, uh, so basically this is a coupling between your uh, magnetic atom and underlying superconducting condensate. Oh, okay. so, so it depends on, on actually how your position, how your atom is placed on the surface or whether it's a place directly or there's some kind of insulating in between or I mean in principle that, that strength of this coupling is is, is J. Um, the in, in principle there's no guarantee that when you place an atoms they will be ferromagnetic. So this is something in experiments which you can actually probe. I'll, I'll show that. Uh, but there are systems where it's actually not uh, ferromagnetic. So, so I showed a few slides ago, I showed this uh, uh, um, slide with the chiral atoms arrangement, and that was actually inspired from the experiment. So in a group of Professor Ronald Wiesendenker, they found a system where, where the chains on the, on the normal metal though, not on the superconductor, make, uh, make uh, some kind of a structure where the atoms are like 120 degrees uh, like uh, 
flip. So it's not it's it's not a, it's not a ferromagnet. It's not antiferromagnet. It's something in between, and that can happen either via some kind of uh, Jozinski Maria coupling or some uh, RKKY coupling. In principle, you can have this this type of arrangement. Sorry, I'm still uh, lost in the physics one So there, there is some coupling that makes the data ferromagnetic, or some boost coupling, or something like that, right? So that, that's one exchange that, that's been split. Actually, what kind of band do you have? Sorry? So, sorry, so you're, you're talking by, about the single atom or, or a chain? With so, so this is about chain. chain. This is all the chain and the exchange coupling. When, I, when, you, when, I, when you ask me about the exchange coupling, I was thinking that you're referring between the atom and the super. No, I'm asking you what you're, you're Sorry? I, I will sh sh I will show you the in our case the atoms are ferromagnetically arranged and they are ferromagnetically arranged we just measure them. So without without the superconductor there's already spin splitting between band and the J, right? Yes. So is that the J then for, for that situation? Yes. But that's different. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Said before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry. So 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 so. The, this is before. Okay, so this is you. This is before putting uh, superconductivity in, but okay. it is a chain on a normal metal. Oh yeah, then, then, then okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So this J is mediated by. It's an RKKY style mediated by. Um, uh, it's not RKKY. It's 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 just you to direct. So basically, the J that that we kind of that we took here. We got from the, the, this is one of these calculations from DFT that we actually kind of yeah you put you put the atoms on the uh, on the surface and and from DFT calculation you can extract some effective J. And it does not depend on the Fermi level of the metal, the K Fermi of the metal. Uh, it does, but you you have that from DFT. Okay. But in principle, you can study this as a function of various parameters. There's no. There's no problem with that. How big should be the moment on this atom? Does uh, it really matter if I have, say, moment of only one tenth of mu b versus, say, five mu b? Uh, I'm not sure what exactly you asking. The size of the magnetic moment on this atoms you put on top of the normal metal. Okay. You form the moment there, right? What's the size of the moment? Well, that depends on the atom, and nominally it's just like it is spin. Uh, five halves or depend, yeah. So for iron, I mean, you, it, 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 it's, it's a, yeah. And it's a moment, why not even four? True. So you, this is something which experimentally you can test. Uh -huh. And theoretically, you can predict with some calculation. So you, in principle, yeah, if you put magnetic atom, you can be completely screened by underlying electrons. But it's kind of known that in many systems, if you put magnetic atoms on various metals, they are still magnetic. And, and this was just tested experimentally with STM for like years now. Um, yeah, so just not to be completely theoretical and kind of make a switch from the theory to experiment. So the, all the measurements that we did uh, was done in this machine and actually I realize now that I'm missing a scale bar here. But this is like a machine which is three stories high and it's like six meters. Uh, and basically all these are like chambers where you kind of prepare your sample, uh, you prepare your kind of, uh, you evaporate your atoms and you actually can then, uh, this is done in this kind of preparation chamber, and then you can actually approach so this needle which I drew as a very, very small scale is something which is of the order of one centimeter and, and the, the, the whole, uh, your wafers live in some, some kind of holders which are in this particular setup shaped in this way. And uh, Ilya and Jankil were the ones actually who, who assembled this setup and it took them uh, quite a bit of time. So now, just by yeah, on a very root scale, what you need to experimentally kind of try to uh, realize this proposal, you need atomically flat superconducting substrate 
you need to deposit these magnetic atoms and they have to form some kind of a chain. Uh, and okay, depending on a substrate, you also need a spin orbit coupling with the spin texture in order to have <coughs> all the ingredients necessary for, uh, for, for this proposal. And what we actually chose is a superconducting lead. Uh, lead is a nice superconductor for this because it can be, so the surface of lead can be cleaned in a relatively easy way. So what you see here is a topographic image of a surface of lead. And these different colors encode basically different atomic heights. So this is, this is flat on atomic scale. So if you zoom in, you see these little balls, these little are actually individual atoms of lead. And you can see that the distance between the atoms along this direction and this direction is not equal. And that's because we choose specific 110 uh, surface of lead where uh, this distance is approximately five angstroms and this is 3.5 uh, square root of two smaller. I'm sure you probably said this, I missed it. And, but you evaporate, you deposit this in situ. So and no, then you look for a nice flat spot? No, this is, this is actually, you, you take a crystal, so you buy a crystal of lead, which has the polished surface of this. Okay. And then you kind of clean it, you heat it up, you bump it with uh, some argon ions to, to remove oxide and all the impurities. And then if you do this like for a week, after that you, you get a clean surface. And then you find some nice spot. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. <coughs> and if you now do the experiment where you actually park your tip, you, so this we used, for this experiment we used tungsten tip, and you actually open your feedback so you keep the distance uh, constant, and you take a bias, you take some kind of a spectrum on, a, on a, any of these points, you will get a nicely looking superconducting gap which will tell you that your gap is 1.35 milli electron volts, which you would expect, and it will also tell you that you're measuring at something like 1.5 Kelvin. So this is the substrate. So the next thing what you need, you, you need to inter introduce these uh, uh, atoms. So what, you, what we do, we basically evaporate atoms at room temperature and just look how they randomly rearrange themselves. And this is one of the picture after the deposition. So this is iron on the surface of lead. And now you can see these are these terraces. And you see these some kind of a grains or some kind of a clusters of iron forming. But from time to time you see some allocating clusters. And if you zoom in into these allocated clusters, you see that they actually, there are some sections of these clusters which are basically forming a chain. And these chains, uh, the, the, these ones are the ones which are like 150, 200 angstroms long, uh, and uh, roughly, just a rough estimate, this will give you like something 70, 80 atoms on a, on a, on a chain. Uh, okay, and now you can really study these chains in, in detail, and you can take these 3D images. So basically what you see, so, so this corrugation along this direction is, is the one which I show in the beginning where I showed the clean let's, uh, surface. So basically what, what, why these chains grow in the first place is because, they, because the substrate is anisotropic. So these chains like to grow in these rows of, of, of underlying substrate. And you can take various cuts uh, uh, like across the chain and like along the chain. And th okay, th there are some, some things which I can discuss now here. So basically what, what we kind of can show is that the, the, chain, the height of the chain is uh, two angstroms, which usually corresponds to one, one atom high chain. What you can also see that there is some corrugation on the, on, the, on, the, on the chain itself, which indicates that you actually, that these atoms do not really fit perfectly in an underlying substrate. And well, I mean, we had, we had like a bunch of these images and we didn't really understand them. So that's where we asked for our DFT collaborators to help and 
And they tried different configurations of the chain and tried to find the minimum of energy and see what can actually, um, what actually they get. And, and they proposed this kind of uh, structure of the chain. So what they told us, your chains are not one atom high, they are actually two atoms high. But furthermore, the, yeah, they are kind of z in a zigzag way. So basically, if you look at this structure, you have like two atoms and one atom, two atoms, one atom, two atoms, one atom. And by comparing, so like on top of this, you can simulate all your measurements, all your STM measurements. And, and in principle, these topographic details match rather nicely. So basically, this corrugation periodicity and the uh, height measurement that, that we can actually measure are well reproduced by this structure of the chain. And okay, they, want, they went a step further and they told us, oh, measure this chain in a wide range of uh, voltages. So this is like plus minus one volt. And we saw this some kind of peak Peaks, these are well outside the superconducting gap. That, that, that they don't have anything to do with the superconductivity. And, and some of these peaks are kind of well reproduced by this tight binding model involving uh, this, this structure. So th this is just, yeah, that we can actually j just to kind of convince you to some extent that we understand the, uh, basically the, the structure of the chain. So the next thing which I only had a question about it was uh, what's about magnetic structure of this chain? Whether these chains are magnetic or these atoms are screen? And this is something which we can actually do measure. And uh, the measurements in this, um, uh, how you do this kind of type of measurement is something called spin polarized scanning tunnel microscopy. So you, for that you, you have to take a magnetic tip. In our case, it was antiferromagnetic chromium tip that we put in our system. And these are these uh, gray atoms. Uh, and that's what you do is you, you, you try to you apply magnetic field. Uh, and you see the contrast which you observed if your field is in one direction versus in the other direction. Uh, I also draw some purple atoms here. Because in these measurements, typically what you do is if you don't see the contrast, you kind of crash a little bit of one of these chains or one of these uh, clusters. And it's likely that you will pick up some iron atom. So in, in, the, the exact configuration of the tip is not well known. But what we care is whether it's magnetic or not, and whether we see, mag whether we see contrast when we apply magnetic field. Uh, and, and this is example of a measurement which we see the contrast. So this is like taken at a fixed bias. I think it was 20 millivolts. And then for some, some field of like minus one, one Tesla here, you see low, so the color here is a conductance. You see much lower conductance than if you apply a field uh, positive. And now you can do this for many, many points. And you can actually take a uh, full, full curve and you see some kind of hysteresis of conductance. So this is actually conductance on the chain minus conductance on the substrate. Uh, and, and that curve forms some, some type of uh, uh, hysteresis, which actually convinces us that, that our chains are really ferromagnetic. Uh, in this type of experiment, you don't really know whether you actually have a tip switching or a sample switching. And here we actually believe that uh, there are some reason to believe that we have a tip switching and not a, not a uh, not, the, the, not, not, not these chains are switching, but nevertheless, you have to have two ferromagnetic and each one switches the configuration in order to, to kind of get the hysteresis. So we know that the both things are magnetic. So this is out of plane? This is out of plane, yeah. Have you done in plane? Uh, yes. I, I don't have a data here, but we, we did in plane because there's a vector magnet. And in principle, uh, is the hysteresis look smaller or not? Uh, really? Well, it, it looks uh, so. The the biggest change is if you apply out of plane. So we are kind of no, we are pretty convinced that the spins of the at of the actual chain are pointing out of plane because the for the, depending on the different angles in plane, you don't see much of a change. 
There are some changes, but uh, it's uh, on a much larger level. We are trying to understand these measurements, so people are they are pursuing but these measurements. Is uniaxial or sorry? Is uniaxial or, or plane? Uh, uh, no, it's basically they have three, it's a three D magnet, so you can you can just fix the field in plane and just rotate, yeah. and you can get funny measurements. He's asking about the anisotropy for, for these guys for these uh, I mean. All the measurements so far are pointing that they are out of plane, but they, it might be that it's not perfect out of plane, that there's some out of plane component, which is much smaller. And uh, I think that this is kind of depending on uh, this configuration of, uh, of a cluster. So it's, it can vary a little bit. This in-plane in component can vary from chain to chain. So we didn't really we had a bunch of chains measured, but we could not tell whether it was uh, like some 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 angle, fixed angle. Yeah, well, I'm worried that you measured a sort of tip, not of the. That is also another. Chain. Yeah, that's another thing. But uh, uh, but the most of like the contrast you get if you do it out of plane. Uh, and then okay, so. Uh, that's the explanation, but you can actually measure how, what, what's the signature of your tip um, when you're doing on the substrate, when you do this on a non-magnetic substrate. And this is actually, this is, and, and it can have some funny signatures also there, but what I'm showing here is a kind of uh, deconvoluted thing, uh, uh, actually subtracted signal, which shows this clear hysteresis. And actually, in the next slide, I'm just going to show it on the substrate, because we think that this also actually means something. But uh, so we, we are here dealing with lead, and the point of this slide is is that we it's very likely that we have a strong spin orbit coupling. So people measured this in thin films, and people calculated it in in a, in a bulk crystals with the DFT, and and they, all of them predict. Uh, strong spin orbit coupling effects, like spin orbit lengths of like couple of angstroms, uh, and also like lead is very heavy element and symmetry is broken on the surface. So there there are reasons to build, to anticipate strong spin orbit coupling. So what we experimentally see is that we have this kind of uh, magnet resistance, which reminds you at, on the on the weak anti localization in some sense. But basically, as you, as you uh, apply high magnetic fields, your conductance uh, drops. Uh, and this would, this would be consistent that, 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 that the spins in on the substrate are kind of in plane. And your tip is kind of mostly sensitive for out of plane magnetization in this case. Uh, we, we do see that it is some kind of a flipping, some kind of a hysteresis type of things, of, of drops here. That's why you think that the tip is also switching when we apply a field. Uh, okay, so now I showed you uh, that at least these three kind of things we have, and uh, finally what, what we want to actually investigate and what we were looking at in the first place are what, how the states in the side of the superconductivity, in su inside of the superconducting gap look like. For that, we pick up one of the nicer chains, and we actually zoom in on one of these segments. A and here we actually have spatially mapped out conductance uh, as a function of voltage between the tip and the sample. And I'll just show you. So this is a, one of the movies that I have. I have it on both ends, but I'll show you this one. So as you go inside, so this is all outside the gap. Now you're inside the gap. And basically, you are inside the gap because here there is nothing. Well, very low density of states, meaning that you are inside the superconducting gap. But there's like many states on the chain. And as you go towards zero, at zero you have some kind of 
accumulation of the states at the chain end and some density of states in the middle, but it's kind of suppressed. And yeah, okay, and this goes on and you can see that there's a, like a rich structure of, of this state. And if you actually uh, park your tip on two different locations, so that one of these locations where you see density of states, you can actually see that there is a, like a peak at zero bias and somewhere in the middle you actually don't see this peak and this is on both ends and you have, we have many chains which show this behavior. Uh, this is just more of, of, the, of this data. So basically, you, you see some structure of some kind of density of states with different energies. And when you are at zero, so this is a different chain, you, you have the accumulation of the states at, at, uh, at the chain end. Uh, and, okay, localization of this, of this peak is of the order of couple of nanometers. So this was one puzzle uh, for, for some time. How can this be so short compared, knowing that the coherence length of flat is like 80 nanometers, much longer than the chain. Uh, but recently there are several papers which kind of explain this. So we naively understood this in the context of these Shiba states, which also decay on the very short uh, line scales. So if you remember the very first slide, when I showed you a single atom on a superconductor, that state also decays on a very short long scale. So it's, it's a kind of a polynomial contribution which scale with KF, and because KF is very, uh, uh, basically give you very short distance. But then there are other uh, more recent work which actually uh, said that there's some kind of a renormalization depending on um, basically where this wave function lives, whether it lives in a superconductor and, uh, or on exactly on the chain. So, so this, kind, this kind of uh, puzzle, I hope it's gonna, it was resolved. Um, so this is just more data on a different, on a similar chains. And one other thing which we kind of want to what I want to point out, so this is basically now energy versus distance. So it's, you take one of these cuts and you actually plot for each, um, for each point you plot the whole spectrum. So outside the chain you see these two highlighted things are density of states uh, of a superconductor, so the coherence peaks. And if you go now if you into the chain you see in the beginning you see this kind of uh, structure here. Which, which is this zero, zero bias structure that, I, that is here in red, which, which we kind of observed. Um, and, okay, so if you, if you see a zero bias peak at the end of your chain, you are uh, kind of, as an experimentalist, uh, as an optimistic experimentalist, you are kind of triggered to, to, to actually try to see to, and, and, and the kind of, uh, you're, you're likely to believe that this is Majorana, uh, but at least you can uh, do some tests. So, so depending on your system, you can do some tests to test whether you are actually uh, correct or not. And one of, the, one of the initial, I think it was in the result now, but one of the initial um, skeptics for the case of semiconductor nanowire uh, Majorana fermions was that whether that effect is somehow how related to a quantum physics. And uh, in, in this particular system, it's very easy to actually rule out quantum. Uh, and that's by just, so if you have a quantum uh, physics related, you would not expect that uh, these, these kind of peaks are related to, directly to a superconductivity. So if you apply some small magnetic field, so which you can suppress superconductivity everywhere on the chain, the, you can see what remains. And if you have a quantum physics involved, you would expect that some peaks remain in that case when the, when the, when the sample is not superconducting. 
So in, for our measurement is like if you apply magnetic field and suppress superconductivity, nothing remains. So this, 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 this structure, whatever it is, it's strictly related to uh, superconductivity of the substrate. Uh, oh yeah, so th these are the measurements that, that so up to here, that are measurements which, uh, which were done while I was at, at, at Princeton. Uh, but the people there, uh, Ben, Ilya, and Malika, actually they continued and they wanted to improve some of these measurements uh, by, by taking it to a lower temperature. So basically they, you, the setup that I showed you, they actually moved it, well not moved it, but they rebuilt it to another cryostat, which is like uh, going to much lower temperatures. That they are, they are at this electron temperature of 250 millikelvin, so they can actually improve a little bit more. And when they measure uh, the, the super, just superconductivity super conductivity on a substrate, they now started observing two gaps, which is uh, actually what you would expect from, from, from lead, because it has two Fermi surfaces and has slightly two different gaps. Uh, and when they measure, uh, like this is just very <coughs> preliminary data, uh, on, on somewhere in the middle of the chain and in the end of the chain, they still see this zero bias peaks. The peaks are now narrower the structure is more rich. Um, so, but, but the, the important point message I want to convey that, that, that this peak is still very close to zero and still at the chain end. Um, so, basically the physics didn't fully disappear if you go to a lower temperature. Um, the other thing which, which uh, people at Princeton are now why isn't there an electron hole symmetry and why, why are all the other peaks and symmetry? So, so the other peaks are the ones, so I mean, if you, if you put magnetic atoms, just put the signal, magnetic atoms on the surface, you will have many states. These states will form some kind of a band structure, which can be complicated, be simple depending on how, your sim how, you, how is your system. So we are kind of thinking that the other states are just coming from this other But this is the basically structure. make the entire band structure, right? Because you measure the k direction, which you can deduce by the k, and then you can plot the dispersion along this direction and show that all the others are dispersing like Shiva state that you expect, apart from this. Right? True, if you would have infinite resolution and if, you would, if your chain would be super long and super, like, in a perfect way, then you could do some of these things. Yes. So I think, basically, here it's, you, you, need, you need longer chains, I think, to get really nice dispersion. You will get some points, but not, as, not dispersion uh, as you would like to, to see it. So the other, uh, uh, basically, thing that they, they were trying, they were trying to actually embed the whole chain into a superconductor. And uh, one of the problems is that you see that this background of, on, the, on, the, on the peak is, is actually quite significant. And the, the idea here is that if you, if you put more superconductor on top, that maybe you will have a uh, basically uh, suppressed um, this magnetism to some extent so that you will have actually more, more of uh, uh, superconductivity and lower background. And that worked to some extent. So this is now, again, 1.4, 1.5 Kelvin measurement in a different system where they, after depositing chains, they evaporated extra uh, layer of lead. And you can still measure uh, the peaks, the zero bias peak at the end of the chain. Uh, the stuff on the mid chain, kind of, these other peaks got suppressed to some extent. Uh, but it didn't really yet go to zero. So one way to pursue is to try this kind of chains in the other system, which again will take some time to, um, uh, to kind of realize. And um, you can also actually try to uh, do a better energy result measurements using superconducting tip. We did this a little bit uh, at Princeton, uh, basically, the data looks very similar to the normal tip, it's just the, the, you see more of a structure. And what I wanted to point out that very recently from uh, two other groups reproduced the growth of these chains and they are, they are investigating 
So one is Katarina uh, Franke's group at, at the Freie Universität in Berlin, and the one is group in Basel by Ernst Meyer. So people kind of are at least reproducing these chains, and they can do the, the comparative measurements and maybe actually reveal something, uh, some, some new. Uh, Something new. So uh, this is the summary. Uh, yeah, basically, I, I kind of try to convey you this new, or relatively new, uh, uh, way to create Majorana fermions, at least in theory. And I showed you some observation of these uh, zero bias peaks, which occur at the end of the, such a kind of atomic chains. We, which are consistent with the Majorana scenario where you had the interplay of ferromagnetism and spin orbit couplings. And with this, I would like to thank you and I'm looking for questions.